partnership uh, across Health Education England, the World Health Organization, and, and of course, the University of Salford. Um, there are four or five sessions, and, um, and these have been working really well. And we've got a great deal of opportunity through the day to engage with our audience um, through our speakers. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity for, for Q&A. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, throughout uh, this seminar. It is really important to set out, of course, that these action learning sets aim to create a really lasting and strong community of practice so we can all learn from each other across the globe. It is very much about supporting capability and capacity, but also knowledge transfer and expertise. Um, there is real appetite for making sure that we learn from each other in terms of the challenges and the issues that we have within our host nations, but also importantly, some of the opportunities that we can in terms of, of policy development as well as also planning and also uh, delivering of different types of health and social care service. Now we as part of our organisation um, have a development programme that we support um, through it, the whole of the NHS in relation to uh, development of workforce planning and following the COVID-19 pandemic workforce planning and capability it is, has always been important, but increasingly important, not only in terms of how do we deliver change coming out of the back of this pandemic, but importantly, how do we build sustainable health and social care services? So it's really important that we see that um, collaboration and cooperation on a global stage in relation to this is a vital part of, of shared learning and understanding. The first seminars back in December were really about uh, the introduction to workforce planning. Um, it touched on areas such as how do we approach this systematic nature of planning, as well as also contributing to the strength and understanding of how planning links to better healthcare service delivery. Uh, we've had fantastic speakers previously, including Jim Campbell from the World Health Organization, Naveen Evans, who's the Chief Exec of Health Education England, and now uh, the Chief Workforce Officer for the uh, entire NHS, as well as also Rob Smith, who many of you know is our Director of Workforce Planning and Intelligence here at Health Education England. The second seminar, absolutely uh, chaired by my colleague, uh, Professor Jed Byrne, discussed the role of workforce planning uh, in, in anticipating and responding to, to the seismic challenges that we see within the demand for health and social care service. Of course, we were a, a particular focus on COVID-19, but there are other drivers in relation to this, um, other events, as well as also um, economic and wider shocks that create these sorts of challenges. And it's certainly something I can relate to, having led uh, work operationally and strategically uh, uh, here in England, particularly in relation to uh, delivering of workforce training and support for the vaccination programme, something um, we in England and the UK were proud, uh, but also importantly, we shared across the globe working with partners uh, to learn from them about their approaches in relation to this, but also to share some of the approaches that we took. Now, it's important to re re reflect, of course, that each different nation has different approaches in terms of how their systems and services are set up in relation to workforce for their system. And again, having fantastic speakers from across the globe really help us in understanding what lessons we can learn in relation to uh, management of, of COVID-19, as well as also importantly, recovering and, and sustainability of services. This third session goes into uh, further into practice with sessions getting into uh, nuts and bolts of how we go about workforce planning of healthcare professionals and on different international stages. And one of the challenges, of course, uh, is, is understanding the needs and demands driven from um, our population, all very different across the globe. But some of the principles and design features of that are really are uh, very common. And it's really important to uh, understand how that's done, particularly in relation to uh, governments or the approaches taken in terms of funding uh, strategies for individual uh, health based systems. But also importantly, um, uh, education as well as also uh, uh, electoral cycles are really important features, particularly where we've got state based systems in relation to training and education, recognising that it may be a hybrid uh, across the world. It is important that during these sessions, we really um, want to re you to really engage and reflect uh, uh, on how uh, this is working within your own setting. Uh, we've got plenty of, like I say, lots of opportunities to uh, uh, discuss and, and question and answer as also as well as the speakers posing 
questions to you. Um, for me, that's really, really important that actually at the end of their presentations, there's a question there to for all of us to reflect on a specific topic area around planning and debate amongst uh, yourselves uh, and with your uh, cohort. So uh, please use the chat function. We have available in Zoom. I can see uh, colleagues joining from Salford, London School of uh, Hygiene, Tropical Medicine and Namina joining us from Macedonia. So fantastic to see um, colleagues joining us from around the globe. Uh, to, to listen and learn and reflect. So please feel free to ask your own questions of the speakers. We'll do our very best to address those in the Q&A sessions a little bit later. Um, so please do that. We've got uh, lots of speakers um, uh, with really, really extensive experience from their, um, from their countries to, to do today. Uh, a reminder to international colleagues, and, and it's in the chat box, um, we are of course uh, uh, doing this uh, globally, but we are inst instantly translating this into Russian, so if colleagues would like to listen to us in Russian, the uh, um, approach you need to take in relation to is in the sidebar, if that's your preferred language. We are of course also recording um, these sessions and made available to colleagues in the next few days. Um, so. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to welcome so many uh, colleagues joining us today. It's fantastic to be part of a session like this. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, our first speaker in a moment. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our sp first speaker. Um, it's really exciting uh, to welcome to uh, the virtual stage. He probably needs no introduction. Um, it's Rob Smith, uh, who is the Director of Workforce Planning and Intelligence here at Health Education uh, in England. Um, he's been uh, working for the NHS for over 34 years as a, a strong background in, in finance um, and now he's moved into the fabulous world of workforce planning and we're ever in his debt for doing so um, and he's been one of the uh, founding uh, developers of workforce planning intelligence data within the health service there's no better person to, to bring to the stage first of all to to learn from uh, and to share his thoughts and wisdoms about that and, and it would be great to see what the uh, Rob has to say. So uh, Rob, over to you. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> lots an introduction. Um, yeah, I, I, let me try and live up to some of that. Um, look, I've been, my name's Rob Smith, Director of Workforce Planning and Intelligence, and it has been my privilege to uh, be in the world of workforce planning for over 20 years now. Um, Addressing the workforce challenges of health and care systems is universally acknowledged as one of our wicked problems. Um, uh, it's why we're here <clears throat> and it's why I'm always happy to talk to international colleagues so we can learn and share with each other about how we all, all tackle this. Could, could we move on to our next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this is about <clears throat> workforce planning from our perspective in England at the time being. <clears throat> and. Um, and where we've kind of started our thinking recently is to say, why is this so hard? Um, why has workforce planning got such a difficult reputation and perceived as such a difficult thing to do? Um, and the kind of place we've started from is that one of the main challenges that we see as workforce planners is that, the, that there's this fragmentation and misalignment of effort. Um, and we start to think about why that was. Uh, and from our perspective, um, we think there are three key reasons which lead to this kind of fragmentation. The first and by far the most important is this first point, which is we, we fail to integrate our workforce planning with our service and financial planning. Um, all too often, workforce planning is treated as a discrete uh, activity. I mean, even today, we're on a call talking about workforce planning, um, and there is a risk that we perpetuate this separateness. Um, so I'm going to come on to a minute about how we how we might tackle that that challenge. Um, secondly, the planning landscape is incredibly complicated. Workforce planning is not a single activity. Um, we'll come on to a minute about what we mean by that complexity, but basically at different levels over different time horizons, yes, um, there's a huge complex landscape. <laughs> Okay, Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, the other part of the misalignment is that when it comes to acting on the problem, the levers are held by different people at different parts of the system. 
Uh, and how do you get a comprehensive answer to your challenge when there's this dispersed uh, dispersed effort? Um, so integrated planning is um, the word we've given to a framework that seeks to acknowledge those factors um, and deliberately tries to, to address them. So can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is a version of our integrated planning framework. Uh, it's not a detailed model. Uh, it's simply a guide to try and ensure that the key issues are understood and acknowledged by all the partners in it. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the steps in this middle column. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain the other elements of the um, framework um, uh, in a minute. So as I said, the, the key issue, the number one issue, is that any planning approach has to be led by the service goals and the service plans that you're seeking to, to, to solve. Um, far too often, um, we start at step one or two or three. Um, we've deliberately colour coded this orange and blue. Um, what we're saying is don't try and do the blue on your own. Don't try and do workforce planning. Um, if you haven't got your service and financial planners engaged with you, you're almost bound to fail. So we're really, really making this clear to people, which is this is integrated planning, not workforce planning. And if you haven't got the people responsible for planning with you, you're going to really struggle. And that's why the, we have these boxes on the left, because it's about the leadership of this planning and the ownership and the sponsorship that's key. We can all live down here in the little blue box on the left and say we're workforce planners and try and get it done. But if we don't have the people in charge of planning on the pitch with us, um, we're, we're going to struggle. Um, so we need those people to acknowledge that this is the challenge and then act with us to solve it. Let's be clear, they're probably not in the room at the moment. So this is a real kind of clear definition of what the challenge is. How do we get the service planners, the people in charge of planning our system goals, to take workforce planning uh, seriously? Once you've got that established, this becomes a fairly traditional process. You establish the workforce need that goes with those service plans. You make an assessment of whether um, supply, whether that be in numbers or skills, is available to meet that requirement. But the other thing we really like to stress using this model is this third point, which is it's all right having a diagnosis, but you then have to do something about it. And we come to this issue that the, the levers are held um, by different agencies. Um, uh, and therefore you need an all levers plan. It's not sufficient for individual people to pull individual levers and hope to get an answer. What we're trying to do here is align the different levers on the problem. Um, now you can describe those levers in many ways. This is box three down in the, in, the, in the corner there, but we've kind of picked five main headings. So we see that most actions fall into these groups. So it has to either be about service redesign, which will change the demand, or workforce redesign in terms of the skills and uh, the MDT mix, the multidisciplinary team mix that you have that can check, uh, affect the demand for workforce. There are actions you can take about being a good employer to make sure you retain and recruit staff. There are other um, shorter term actions you can take, including international recruitment and use of temporary staff. And then critically, of course, people often focus on and um, what's our long term supply from our own kind of domestic training um, uh, route. Um, and we'll come on to later as to, as to why that's iterative. So if this is our generic approach um, to planning, um, in theory, that covers two of our main challenges we discussed earlier. Integration of service planning with workforce planning and alignment of the levers for action. So how do we address the third one, which is the complexity of the system? Can I have the next slide, please? <coughs> Look. This system is workforce planning isn't a single thing. It's complex because we need to plan for different things. We need to plan for different time horizons. We all plan at different levels of the system. Some of my colleagues later you'll hear um, come from providers, some come from uh, regions, some come from national systems. Um, and then people plan through uh, different lenses, whether that's a plan for a whole geography or through the, through the lens of a service or through the lens of a profession. Um, and then, as we've said previously, the levers for action are held by different people. So this describes a huge and complex landscape and matrix. Uh, and we feel one of the key challenges is to make sure that you can align and coordinate these different, uh, different efforts. So I'm just going to illustrate a couple of those um, 
complexities uh, for you. Go on to the next slide. So the, the first of these is, is planning for different time horizons. Um, so even if you take that standard approach I've described earlier, how you apply it will be different depending on what time horizon you're looking for. Um, so we can think of three main bubbles and then one of those is subdivided, but basically our view is, is that if you're trying to plan for a period between kind of one and five years out, it has some specific characteristics that affect how you plan. And critically, that is you probably have some reasonable certainty about what you're trying to achieve over that period, and even some degree of certainty about how much money you might have to do it. The other thing that's critical in that period is that of all the levers you have got, training and education probably isn't the big one, because the time lag before you get new staff means that you have to use your other levers. So you can see there are some conditions there which mean the way we go about planning either for this year or the following year or the next few years, may be different to how we plan in the longer term. In the five to 15 year period, we're clear that key differentials by profession might emerge, you know, new priorities, new technologies, different mixes of staff, and critically in that space, how you do plan for education and training supply can have a significant impact. And we spend a lot of time thinking in that middle bubble about how we uh, train people. But we have a little caveat on that that says, let's not lose sight of the trend. The trends are really clear. Demand for staff has grown pretty steadily for the past 50 years in our health system at somewhere between two and 3% a year. So why wouldn't it do it again for the next 20 years? So perhaps lose some of the bumps and lumps of the kind of um, political cycles and fiscal cycles that Mark just described and say, let's have a really solid think about how we create sustainable supply for, for, for a longer period. Now, what we kind of say is don't do those things in isolation. Let's try and find a system that complements each other across those time horizons and is comprehensive. So um, perhaps we'll go on to my next slide, please. So similarly, there is complication in terms of how people choose to plan. People want to plan through the lens of their service. You know, mental health colleagues want to know about the mental health plan, cancer colleagues want to know about the cancer plan, primary care about primary care. It's perfectly natural to say, what's the workforce challenge through that lens? Similarly, we have professional leads that say, how do we plan for healthcare scientists? How do we plan for allied health professionals? How do we plan for nurses? How do we plan for doctors or specialties within doctors? And then some poor so-and-sos are in charge of having a plan for the whole place, which is the sum of those two plans. Those things aren't going away. Pathways are inherently multi-professional. So when you're planning on a pathway basis, it's going to be inherently multi-professional because it's teams that deliver pathways. Professions are inherently multi-pathway. They cover different pathways. The demand for that profession will arise from different services and, and places the sum of, sum of both. We're clear that most demand signals are driven by pathways. How much work do you want to do at what time? We're also aware that most supply is through the lens of professions. So I think you've just got to acknowledge this grid isn't going anywhere. And we, and again, the challenge is to make sure that you look at it through all the lenses and do that, that coordination piece. Go on to my next slide and final slide. So the final thing here I just want to stress is that this isn't a linear process. It's very much um, an initiative process where you go through this process of identifying your service goals, your workforce requirement, your supply assessment, and potentially a gap, but then you act on it, which changes those things. So you can do service transformation, which changes your service plans and therefore your workforce requirement. You can change the nature of your team, or you can do things to boost your supply. And ideally you do them all and you do them all in concert. At the end of the day, though, you may also find that workforce is an absolute constraint and you may have to reprioritize your service goals. People don't like that as an action. They kind of say, and here's what we want to do. Please tell me how we're going to do it. But frankly, if supply is a, a total constraint, then you're going to have to think about how do we achieve our goals over a different time horizon. So I hope you found that useful. This is a kind of generic framework to how we're approaching planning uh, in England. It's calling out these difficult problems of the complexity of the landscape. Um, and at the moment, for instance, we're doing work on behalf of the Secretary of State for a long-term strategic framework and a medium-term financial plan. And at the same time, we're helping trusts and ICBs and ICSs think about their current operating plans and their three to five-year plans. 
but you've got to do it all and you've got to do it in a way which aligns with, with each other so hopefully you found that useful um and i'm happy to be taking questions later i think it's my turn there we go it's my question for you so in light of all of that how do we ensure responsiveness and flexibility of planning so we can retain relevance and validity in rapidly changing health systems because they do um, so i hope you found that useful um love to speak to you later thank you brilliant thanks rob what a great way to start and uh yeah i think a really important question for us to kind of think about um uh during uh the the conference today um fantastic great presentation um I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, Verle Vivet, who is a statistician and uh, the uh, Federal Public Service of Health in Belgium. And it's really great to have our European partners here today, has led a, a huge amount of workforce modelling, um, uh, both in Belgium and has done work as part of the Joint Action for Health Workforce Planning and Forecasting for the European Un Union. So just absolutely delighted to uh, welcome you here today. Good, uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, so, um, as the chair has already said, my name is Pierre Vivet. I am the head of analytics uh, for the health workforce planning in Belgium. I already have 10 years of experience, so not as much as, uh, as Rob, but um, that's all right. I will give you an overview um, of the history of health workforce planning in Belgium. Uh, I will focus as well on the challenges we face. And last but not least, I would like to uh, show you some of our latest results. Um, you can show the next slide, please. So uh, this slide gives you an a, a brief historical overview because uh, the, health, the, the Federal Planning Commission of Belgium, so the Health Workforce Planning in Belgium, was founded in 1996 already. Uh, it was created at first to limit the number of medical doctors and dentists, and thus to limit also the health expenditure. Now, our first projection model um, was very limited, with limited variables, limited professions only to uh, medical doctors and dentists. But we but Along the years, we try to improve um, as well as the model, as well as the variables, as well as the professions. And one of our biggest achievements uh, is the creation of the cadastre, which is the federal database of health workforce professionals. So this federal database contains information about all those healthcare, to, healthcare workers who applied for a license to practice. Um, our next biggest achievement would be uh, our data linking project. So that's when I joined the, um, the Health Workforce Planning of Belgium. At, 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 at that time, I joined the Health Workforce Planning of Belgium. And then we combined the data of the cadaster, so the data of licensed to practice health workforce uh, professionals, to national databases from social security and national institute for health insurance so this leads so we know uh, how many licenses to practice they are but also how many um, professionally active and practicing nurses doctors um, and so on um, they are currently in belgium um, as i've said we can we develop we, de we develop continuously uh, our projection model and currently, we monitor almost all health workforce professionals, which are registered in the cadastre, and we make future projections for um, a selection of professions. There are no uh, medical doctors, dentists, um, nurses, midwives, physiotherapists, and speech therapists. Um, next slide, please. But to fully understand the complexities and also the challenges we face in, uh, in Belgium with the planning process, it is inevitable to give you some background ex explanation. Um, most of, um, I don't know um, how many of you know, but Belgium uh, is quite a complex um, country where there is one federal state which is responsible for the majority of healthcare, uh, not all healthcare, but I will not go into, that, <laughs> into all the details. Um, and it's divided in three communities, but there are two major communities. 
in the north, we have the Dutch speaking community uh, because of our border with the Netherlands. And in the south, we have the French speaking community where there is the border with, with France. So there's a clear language barrier. And these communities are responsible for education, which means that, for example, the study length uh, for becoming a nurse is uh, different in the north. Sorry, for the French speaking, uh, for the French, uh, is different for the Dutch speaking uh, students than for the French speaking students. Another example is the selection criteria for uh, starting medical school, also different because in Berlin. Um, in the Dutch community, there has been an entrance exam for almost 25 years, and in the French community, there has not been. It will be installed next year. So all of these challenges, um, I can go to the next slide, please. So all these challenges we faced in 1996 uh, were the main reasons to set up a health workforce planning in the first place. So one would think that after all these years, we have, we have addressed these issues, but unfortunately they remain relevant. Even before COVID or after COVID, um, the challenges we face in Belgium are of course to ensure the quality of care, which is why the um, uh, planning commission was founded, to have enough medical doctors and dentists, but not too much, because oversupply can be detrimental to the quality. Of course, to control expenses, as in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of uh, too many doctors, too many expenditures. And uh, as we all know, um, supply induced demand. When there is a doctor, he will find his patients. It's for all, uh, not, not <laughs> it's also for nurses or for um, speech therapists. And one of our biggest um, challenge is the geographical imbalances. Due to our language barrier, it creates a cutoff. There are um, imbalances caused in the sector or by profession. And it makes it more difficult, even if we would uh, implement relocating incentives, it's uh, rather difficult to implement these. Uh, because French doctors will speak French and not Dutch and, and the other way around. And the population of the French and Dutch community is somewhat different as well, which leads to different health healthcare needs. The, com the uh, Dutch community is in general um, a bit older and they need more. And due to their um, uh, higher um, um, age or mean age, uh, they, their demand for, a nur for nursing care or their demand for medical care is larger than in the French community. And I would like you to show this to you with some data. So if you please uh, go to the next slide. You know, the data represented in this graph are from our latest report on the future projections of nurses. It will be published next week, so it's really it, um, it's been finished for maybe a few weeks. Um, now this graph, it shows the um, evolution in percentage compared to 2018. So 2018 is our baseline. And then we look at in blue, the population adjusted to demand for nursing care. So the demand for nursing care is in blue. And then in, in orange, there's the number of nurses practicing. So in an ideal world, the number of nurses would increase exactly at the same rate as the, as the demand of nurses would increase. As you can see in the Flemish community, this will not um, be the case. There will be some in the future, there will be problems if trends persist um, as they have been in the past. In the French community, next slide please. There is, a, um, there is a difference. As you can see, the evolution of both variables is more similar, which means that the, the problem or the, call it however you want, will be uh, less of a problem in the French community than in the Dutch community. 
So it's um, again uh, as we these are the baseline projections. So they only include the supply and demand. So the supply is all nurses active in healthcare sector, and the demand is the population, the aging population, and the, and the population composition of Belgium. Uh, but with these two variables, we can already see a difference between the communities, and we can also see that in the future we have to monitor or we have to um, uh, try to um, tackle these issues. In the next slide, um, please don't be afraid of all the data, but um, it's a great it's a great table because it's it highlights the differences uh, between the French community and the Flemish community. It shows the results of all baseline scenarios by uh, healthcare sector, again for nurses. So left there are the French communities and we compare the, we compare the results of 2018 with 2043 because we project uh, for 25 with a 24 five year horizon. Um, and the differences between French community and French, French community are again, really visible. And it's also clear that especially nursing homes will face uh, the biggest challenges um, because of course, the, because the population will age more and more the baby boom generation of today will, in 20 years, they will be in the nursing homes. And that's exactly what these um, graphs uh, are showing. We hope to have some answers to these issues as we will continue our work to unravel the differences and the outcomes by the end of the year. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions afterwards, but I think it's now time for my question uh, to you. So uh, what are your top three challenges of health workforce planning and how do you manage them? Um, because as you have seen in my presentation, the three biggest challenges are still relevant today and I want, um, can be interested to learn if that's uh, also countries where have the same issues or different issues and how did they uh, their management. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. What a great presentation and question, Bede. So, I mean, top three challenges for people. I mean, it's great the chat box is alive now with lots of people discussing Rob's question. So I'm sure uh, the same will happen again. Um, it's a, a really important, great detail on the data, actually. But I, I love those two graphs. I'm gonna take those away, actually, and ask Rob to see what he can do to produce them here for us in England. Um, so uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite our next uh, speaker. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Shashank Vikram, who's uh, currently the Consul General of India in Birmingham, uh, trained as a doctor, but more recently working as a diplomat. So absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Vikram here today. And uh, uh, just putting his headphones on now, um, bringing you in live. Over to you, sir. I think you're still on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear yes, me? We can indeed, yes, you're live. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mark, and um, to all the fellow panelists and the people who have joined, uh, uh, very good afternoon now to all of you. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here today, and um, with regard to uh, India's uh, health setup and the healthcare, I would like to uh, say a few things just to set the stage, and um, I hope after that, if there are any questions, then I will respond to them. So as you know, uh, India is a large country. When it comes to population, we are the second most populous country in the world. We are 1.3 billion and counting, might be even more now. And uh, 
that brings itself a lot of, I would say, health challenges, because if you have such a large population, then the responsibility of the state is also humongous when it comes to a essential service like health. And uh, I would, uh, I'm very, I would be, um, I think it's a, uh, it's a bigger structure, but uh, let me try to uh, decipher it a bit for you. So as you know, India is a federal country and it has a lot of estates. Now, health in India is basically a subject of the, primarily of the state governments. So if you go to any state in India, and India has very large estate. I personally come from a state from called uh, Uttar Pradesh, which to put in perspective has a population of around 200 million. So the states are huge and hence they have also have large health setup. So the primary point from where we start is the primary healthcare. So there are some things which we call PHCs, which is basically primary healthcare post where you have a doctor, a pharmacist and a and m and a structure is available for the basic primary consultation. And after that, we have something which we call community health centers, which are basically for the secondary level healthcare. And above them in each district, district is an area, you know, where each state is divided into districts. So, uh, yeah, which is a considerably large area. And each district at that level, we have a district hospital, which is supposed to provide the uh, tertiary level care. Beyond these three, I would say that there are certain very specialized centers, like uh, there are institutions like AIMS, which is All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So similarly, there are AIMS are today are now in several states. Similarly, there are institution like postgraduate institutions, which specialize in several niche diseases. So once the patient is through the district hospital, he requires higher consultation than that. Then generally they refer to these institutions, which are of, I would say are more specialized or further more specialized if somebody needs some specific treatment. Now, when it comes to the state governments, they have these permanent body of healthcare professionals, including doctors, nurses, attendants, and, you know, even administrative staff and everything, which man this state government's health uh, services. And then the role is also shared by the government of the country, which is the government of India. So government of India, through its health departments, supplements the efforts of these state governments. And this happens through several designs and several schemes. One of them I would say an overarching thing is something which we call national health mission. Now, national health mission is, I think, one of the largest publicly funded health programs anywhere in the world you will find. And that focuses on supplementing the efforts of these state government provided healthcare services, not only through funding, but also through very specialized program aiming at a specific situations or disease sets, like for maternal and child health, like for communicable diseases. And, and, and as you know, when we say, when we use the word communicable diseases in a tropical, in a country like uh, India, you know, then uh, there are so many of them. So like one of the major programs, which has been running for many years, has been against the tuberculosis, where a person who is diagnosed, not only, not only that he is provided his basic support, like early diagnosis and free lab services and all, but he's also provided free drugs for all the entire period. So there are different, same, same is there for the non-communicable diseases, for a specific situation like cancers. So that is how National Health Mission supports and National Health Mission, depending upon the need of a state, also then hires contractual health force. Like, you know, we, we need more doctors than what is generally in the permanent cadre of that state, or we need more nurses, or we need more uh, people for outreach in the villages. Then that funding and that recruitment on contractual basis happens through the National Health Mission. It is again a devolved structure. So National Health Mission then has offices in every state of the country. So there it works, the officers there, they work in coordination with the state government 
and depending upon the need and the requirement which are locally there then they project their uh, requirements to the central government and accordingly the national health mission of that particular state is supplemented with funds and then they go for their local recruitment in fact buying uh, medicines or equipments they even fund uh, researchers so that you know uh, if, if some intervention is required and if, if there is a public health challenge which a state is facing they go for it also other than this i would say basic the basic overarching structure government has also done some very specific interventions so like uh, covid you know when it came it became a one of the i would say a challenge which we haven't seen in our living memories so it was an unprecedented challenge and the response to it in a country like india has to be something which has to be unique and also you know it's some unprecedented for us also you know in the terms of the challenges with the health the health of course faced in india at that point of time but as a result of that covid many things have i feel that they have it has accelerated many interventions which earlier were there but they got the fill up they needed like i feel the digital health so the digital health aspect of it whether it is consultations whether it is diagnosis whether it is any kind of i don't know peer to peer consultations things like that all those got a fill up which i think won't have been possible if covid was covid wouldn't have thrown up this great challenge on all of us so during that time government of india also launched another scheme it is called e sanjeevni and that scheme basically offers anyone can go on the website register living in any part of india you can register yourself and then you can also upload your uh, uh, if you have uh, any uh, lab reports or any health, health prior health reports you can upload them and then you will get a direct tele consultation with the doctor who will not only uh, consult you but will also prescribe you medicines which you know government has also opened up a lot of generic medical stores all across india where those medicines are available at a very fair price so with e sanjeevni which was i think one of the new interventions just launched last year it has already seen over 10 million patients and uh, i think number might be even much more because uh, i haven't seen the latest numbers but it has done very well another scheme which i think is uh, one of the largest public health insurance scheme which government has provided i think it must be the it is the largest scheme in anywhere in the world is called ayushman bharat scheme under which the people who earn uh, below a certain level have been provided with a kind of credit card now that credit card has a sum of around 500000 indian rupees which is a very substantial sum in, in india i mean it's a enough sum for you to undergo even a bypass surgery if you wish to in a private setup so the poor people have been provided with this card and our target for that is around uh, the way in which criteria has been put up the ayushman bharat scheme aims to target around half a billion people and uh, these half a billion people can then go to any hospital not only to the government hospitals in india as the structure i described but also the private because in india there is also doctors practicing privately there are they are not only practicing privately there are big private hospitals and uh, uh, there are also um, private labs so that is a parallel system which is there but when we come with ayushman bharat it is kind of conjunction of the two things where government is providing you a kind of a credit card however you can use it the way you wish to use it so like if you think that i would have i would get xyz intervention done in this private hospital where you have more confidence you can just go there and swap your card and get your things done so this is a uh, one of the uh, uh, flagship interventions of the government and it has worked very well also i would say between uh, india and uk you know health sector is one of the priority sectors between the two countries it figures prominently in our 2030 agenda for cooperation and uh, we have been uh, holding regular health conferences between india and uk and several several uh, sectors have emerged there where which 
are uh, uh, under various stages of cooperation and i think there is lot of potential of uh, doing so and uh, one thing which of course will always be there is that scaling cooperation in scaling cooperation in training individuals cooperation in uh, i would say um, uh, qualification uh, the recognition of qualification provided by either countries so that there is a seamless movement of people especially when it comes to a health need so those kind of uh, uh, issues are important as you know india also is known as the pharmacy of the world we are among the largest producers of pharma all over the all over the globe and that is something which this manufacturing capacity when it comes to pharma and products are uh, i think uh, it came to the great aid of the world when the intervention of when the covid vaccine which was developed by oxford was put to scale in india and as going forward we look forward to uh, more such associations india itself has indigenously developed three four more vaccines which are available and if anywhere in the world there is a need we are ready to supply them at the scale required so uh, these are my uh, few points which i would like to add and if uh, there is any any questions i would be very happy to entertain thank you so much no thank you so much and uh, i i think we've got your question on on yes. the screen do you want do you want to read it out uh, shashank yes uh it says that in this global world how do you envisage the mobility and career program of healthcare professionals a career they work which not only fulfills the healthcare need of various organization but also fulfills the career career prospects of the healthcare professionals fantastic thank you dr vikram great presentation and um uh, we've got lots of questions and well, answers actually coming up in the chat box actually so i've got a few uh, for you a little bit later we're going to let okay. uh, let the debate run in the uh, box and then I'll, I'll answer a few questions to you a bit later if i may um okay. it gives me great pleasure to invite our fourth speaker uh, to the virtual stage um real pleasure to invite gila zabiv who is a, a senior certified nurse midwife at uh, hadassah international um and uh, really really great to have colleagues joining us from the um israel israel midwives association um and uh gila had led a huge response in her home country in relation to uh, midwifery care in um uh, covid-19 management um, and implementation and we're absolutely delighted to have you join us today um for your presentation so over to you thank you so so much for having me I don't know if I led a huge response, but I hope I hope I'll be part of something very big in our country. I want to thank the NHS. I want to thank the WHO. I want to thank the Health Education Oh, that's like Health Education England um, for having me today, and all my esteemed col uh, colleagues on this panel. Hearing the things that you're saying, and the options and the potential on global collaboration and change is overwhelming, and um, I hope that one day we can accomplish all these great things that everybody's talking about. Uh, my name is Gila Zarbiv, and I am a certified nurse midwife with a master's uh, in women's health. And I'm also the chair of the media department and inter international liaison for the Israel Midwives Association. And I'm here to speak to you about workforce planning for the Israel Midwives post-pandemic. Next slide, please. So the things we're going to talk about are the issues affecting midwifery pre and post-pandemic in Israel. We're going to talk about the impact of the pandemic in Israel. We're going to discuss the emergence of midwife-led initiatives and the impact of global collaboration on work and planning and the implications for this workforce planning on the Israeli midwives and maybe on the world. Next slide. So the issues that affected midwives pre and post pandemic, I believe are probably, I believe that all of the 150 people at home are nodding their heads. I think these are probably the issues that are affecting us on a global scale. We have issues of workforce, we have issues with our scope of practice, we have issues with lack of midwives in research and in leadership, and also in education, which is part of the research that I put together. We don't have enough midwives in workforce. We are now approximately one midwife to two or three or sometimes four midwives per room when it comes to a shift. Our scope of practice, midwives in Israel are mainly limited to hospital labor and delivery wards. There's a handful of midwives who provide prenatal and postnatal and home birth care. But speaking of the NHS in England and the UK, you are our dream. We dream of getting to a level that is in the UK or in Europe. 
there are not enough midwives in research. There are not enough midwives with graduate degrees and PhDs and doing active research on a daily basis. And there are not enough midwives and nurses in, re in leadership. We have a chief nursing officer, but we don't have a chief midwife officer. And these are some of the issues we were dealing with pre and also post pandemic in Israel. Next slide, please. So what happened in Israel? I was in the clinic in March, 2020. I'm also the head for infectious disease prevention for my hospital, for my labor and delivery ward. And we received a call that our first lady, our first woman who had high suspicion of COVID at the time was on the way. We geared up and we went running and we met a lovely woman who delivered a beautiful, beautiful baby. Next to me is Noah Ben Yeil. She was in the midwife who was with me at the time. And we sent her test. And in those days, it took three days. For those who remember, a few days, we rushed it. But only a day later did we realize that we had just delivered the very first COVID-19 positive birth in Israel, in the country. What helped us manage this situation was that we were prepared. My head midwife at the time and my current head midwife, Olit Moshe, they saw um, that it was coming. We saw that it was coming from China and that the waves were crashing onto our shores and our shores, and we were prepared. We had developed an isolated birthing center. We had stocked up on the proper PPE. I personally had trained every single staff member on how to get dressed, how to take off the clothes. They were all aware of the protocol in place. Everybody understood what they had to do and where they had to be. And that helped us get ready for what, what was coming towards us. Next slide, please. And since then, oh, we've had a few more cases in Israel. These are not exactly up to date as of today. I made the slideshow a few weeks ago, but we have approximately around 4 million cases with approximately 50,000 active cases and approximately 6 million vaccinations. These numbers are just numbers, but they actually put Israel in a very unique place on the map because Israel has what I like to call the three major triangle. We have lots of births. My hospital delivers approximately 800 births per month, per month. And there are hospitals in Israel that deliver about 1,200 to 1,400 per month, births per month. We have a high level of births. We have a high level of vaccination. And we have a high level of people who wanted to know more about all of, the, all of COVID and how it affects pregnant women. And that triangle was able to allow us to do the next slide, which I will show you which is all these new initiatives. We were able to bring in so many new initiatives, putting us in our unique place with a high level of birth, high level of vaccination, and high level of staff who wanted to change things. By every birthing woman stood a midwife. By every woman who was pushing was a midwife. There were no physicians. If I needed a physician, I called one. But the first and foremost line of defense were midwives. This led to an abundance of collaboration between the physicians and the midwives. If the physicians wanted something, it had to go through me because I was the one standing there, which led to beautiful cooperation and collaboration for new fields of research. And that led to new initiatives, such as us trying to promote midwifery continuity of care and midwifery suturing. One of the most successful initiatives that came out of the pandemic was midwifery suturing. Midwives started suturing because the midwife was standing there anyways. And the physicians had an incentive to allow the midwives or to want not to, I won't say to allow, it's not their choice, but to push the midwives to suture because then they have to down up and come in and go to the COVID ward. So this unique perspective of having this one-on-one -on -one midwifery care with this new concept for Israel, this exclusive midwifery design pushed for midwife initiatives. I know the COVID was a hard time, but a lot of beautiful things came out of it. Next slide, please. Research. I understood the value of research through COVID-19. I had the distinct honor to publish five or six articles with esteemed colleagues, which were watershed articles, the first of their kind, like the one on the next slide, please, where you will see that it was one of, we were one of the first people in the world to prove that not only is the vaccination safe in pregnancy, but that it also vaccinates the fetus. And our last article that was just published in Clinical Infectious Disease on the 19th of June showed exactly the perfect maybe timing, perhaps, of when to vaccinate. Again, back to the three unique issues that we had in Israel. A lot of women, a lot of vaccinations, and a lot of births, and a, want, a desire to do this collaborative research. Next slide, please. The most beautiful thing, the most beautiful thing that came out of such a devastating pandemic was the global collaboration. 
all of you here today, sitting with hundreds of people today across the globe, we are not people on a screen. We are not people sitting behind Zoom. We are potential change. Each person who took the time today, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world, you are here because you care. You are here because you want to do change. This is crucial. We cannot minimize the work that the WHO does. We were on top of the protocols. The WHO didn't just send out pictures of ideas. The second the WHO announced that we didn't need to separate mothers and babies, it was in May. The second that they announced that we stopped separating mothers and babies, that's global collaboration. That's hands on the pulse. That's something that's done a click of a button in England or New York that's affecting the lives of women in Israel. Our collaboration with the ICM, where we're able to work together with women around midwives, around the globe and enact protocol. What are you doing in your country? I'm going to adapt that for mine and have the unique opportunity to be involved in the steering committee for midwives and focus and the nursing now challenge. All through my work, the last logo is the, the Israel Midwives Association. Our tiny, tiny midwives association in Israel suddenly has the ability to interact with people on a global scale and enact actual change on the ground. It's mind boggling when you actually think about it. Next slide, please. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do now? We need to stop talking. <laughs> we need to stop talking and we need to start doing, we need to demand. There are 148 people here today. We need to stand up, the nurses, the doctors, the midwives, every single person who is here today, and we need to demand more funding for education, for research, for leadership. We need to make sure that each and every one of us are working within our scope of practice. Midwives can do so much more than we're already doing, and that takes me to my next slide. According to the State of the World's Midwifery in 2021, they announced that if midwives actually worked within their scope of practice, we could save 4.3 million lives annually. Every single person here needs to stand up and demand change on a global scale. If we stood with one voice and with one demand, the world could not ignore us. If every nurse, midwife, and doctor demanded that the world paid attention to the lessons we learned from the pandemic, that women needed care of midwives by their side, that nurses and doctors and midwives were crucial, crucial to the, I would say, survival of the human beings on this planet. And we demanded change and said, this is where the funding needs to go. I don't think anybody could stop us. Next slide. And that leads me to my final point. How? How can we effectively and efficiently promote, implement, and support global collaboration and cooperation in a way that leads to sustainable, measurable, and actual change in the ground? How do we take these Zoom conversations where we all sit, and my esteemed colleagues all said the same thing, and enact them to actual change on the ground? Whoever has the answer, I would love to hear it. I look forward to hearing from all of you, and thank you again to the NHS and the WHO for having me here today. It was truly an honor. Thank you, Gail. No, the honour's ours, actually, and I think, uh, you know, just lots of uh, congratulations and thanks for an inspiring presentation, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have lots and lots of questions for you a bit later, which I've, I've got one or two myself, actually, but thank you uh, for your presentation, and uh, uh, great to see that the work um, in Israel, I have to say, during uh, the COVID-19 vaccination program, uh, we looked to uh, Israeli colleagues a lot for some of the approaches they were taking in, in terms of design data uh, transparency, so, so thank you. Um, our final presentation, um, and again, keep the uh, questions and the chat going in the chat box, it's great to see. Um, really delighted to uh, our final speaker, uh, last but definitely not least, is Professor Ronald Battenberg, who is the programme leader in Health Workforce and Organisational Studies and Healthcare at the Netherlands Institute of Health at Utrecht, as well as also Professor of Health Workforce and Organisation Studies at uh, Radboud University. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Rat Battenberg, uh, over to you. Okay, I'll try again. It's my microphone your microphone's working perfectly oh, okay 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 i was switching my right option okay thank you mark and thank you all uh, thank you for the organization of this uh, 
of this meeting and um, it's a pleasure and honor to be invited to uh, say something about the health workforce planning system and model in the Netherlands and uh, but not only how it is organized currently in the Netherlands but also what are the future challenges we are facing uh, uh, from uh, this area um, and I would like to then to move to the next slide please because a small introduction is needed, I think, uh, not so much on our small country. You probably you all know where the Netherlands is uh, located, and we are a small country, but we have 17 million inhabitants. And the demand of those inhabitants for healthcare and healthcare services are increasing. While we have quite some uh, some problems to live up to those uh, to the service level we are actually used to. So the, what is previous, previously has been addressed as the shortages and the pressure on the labor market and the pressure for uh, for health workforce capacity is also uh, really at stake and at an urgent stake here in, in our country. Um, so we. Uh, before I go into the system of health workforce planning, I think it's uh, good to mention that uh, we have a system in which the min our Ministry of Health is controlling the entire medical schools and after medical schools also controlling the training places for medical specialization training. This is defined by budget by our Ministry of Health, and this is actually the key instrument to control and if needed to adapt also the inflow rates so to adjust to achieve the equilibrium at the labor market. This is done for the group of physicians in the Netherlands. Uh, well, if you look at the group of nurses and paramedics, which is obviously a larger group of the health workforce, it is monitored, but those uh, the inflow as such is not regulated by the Ministry of so what I will talk about next up, next slide, please, is the organization of uh, health workforce planning for physicians in the Netherlands. Uh, since 1999, so already 20 years ago, an independent organization was uh, initiated in the Netherlands on the advisory committee on medical mental planning, and this advisory committee is advising this ministry, our Ministry of Health, with regard to optimal inflow. Uh, training inflow for medical schools and specialization training. And this uh, advisory committee uh, is actually working with a simulation and forecasting model, which I will uh, uh, explain a little bit later on, but also as an important task to mobilize practice to ensure consensus and to support the implementation of the inflow advisory. So it's not only a planning system in terms of a mathematical system, but also a policy system. Next slide, please. So this advisory committee, uh, committee of medical manpower planning is uh, using uh, the market forecasting model, which has been developed by uh, our institute, Nouvel, and likely contains of three parts. The first two parts is, I think, quite similar to uh, many countries in which health workforce planning is uh, conducted. So. We try to uh, project what is the available capacity uh, of the uh, physicians, uh, professions over the next 15 years. So that is our scope for uh, the scope of the uh, model. An outflow of the profession, and the internal training, for instance, all kinds of variables comes into that part of the model. And then secondly, it's project, projected for the same period what would be the required capacity or if you wish to do more or use it in that profession. And then thirdly, the model also calculates from the gap between available and required capacity what would be the optimal yearly inflow of the uh, periods to come and whether this needs to be adjusted upwards or downwards. And then in addition, there is a policy model in place, as I uh, mentioned before. So to ensure that all the stakeholders um, also are involved actually in this exercise. Next slide, please. These stakeholders are actually threefold. And this is a snapshot of uh, uh, 
depiction of our healthcare model, a healthcare system, uh, which is in place in 2006, the government is controlling and regulating, but actually it's a, a joint responsibility of the healthcare insurers and the providers as well. So um, these are the three stakes and the three types of interests of stakeholders that needs to be balanced, balanced in uh, the workforce planning. Next slide, please. Um, these stakeholders are involved in the model as such. Um, here's a snapshot of the model. I will go into the model a little bit later, but the marks and the colored uh, parts of the model, uh, which we actually see on the lower side of, uh, of, the, of the model as such, they are involved in estimating what are the relevant scenarios that needs to be taken into account with regard to the required capacity of a profession like general practitioners or surgeons, for instance. So they are involved in estimating scenarios, but also estimating what will be the harmful developments and what will be the impact of those developments on the demand for the surgical profession. So uh, they, they are involved before we apply the model and we calculate the uh, required inflow to buy the model. Next slide, please. So balancing interests and uh, stakeholder interest is important. So here is an example in which uh, you can see that professions typically have a interest and, and a stake with regard to controlling uh, training flow for their own uh, uh, occupation, while training institutes can have a different interest in terms of uh, preferably having a constant training. Well, healthcare insurance as a representation of the patient interest, and also the cost uh, interest, of course, uh, can have another interest, interest with regard to training inflow as to being the accessibility of, of healthcare. So in the so-called chambers of the uh, advisory committee, those, those stakeholders are around the table and involved with the to help workforce planning system as such. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And uh, as promised, uh, in the next slide, please, um, I'll give you an overview of the model. And I will not run through all the boxes and the percentages that are in the model, but roughly take you through the principles in which the upper part of the model from left to right projects what is the base year capacity that you start with uh, for, in this case, a general practitioners in the Netherlands. You take into account the stock in terms of uh, headcounts, but also full-time equivalents. And then to the right part, uh, to the right, it is projected what will be the net um, effect of in and out flow during, uh, well, let's say 10 or 15 years. So that is the upper part of the model. In the lower part of the model, in which you see the colored boxes, these are the developments and the different factors or parameters, as we uh, used to call them, that needs to be taken into account. And those percentages you see over there are partly based on our studies, uh, on the level of air substitution that is expected between certain occupations, for instance, due to task shifting, but also quality measurements, but also what would be the effects of uh, technical developments, epidemiological developments, which we can base on um, databases uh, that are available from our uh, uh, Central Bureau of Statistics, for instance. And those percentages are actually calculated and taken into account to, uh, to project at the right hand side, what would be the total required supply? And here in this example, you see three scenarios are uh, included, and those scenarios have three different uh, consequences for the required number of GPs in training, which is in the upper um, yellow uh, colored uh, box of, of, the, of the model. So it will depend on what type of uh, development should be taken into account and what are the estimations. Of uh, of them in, uh, on the required supply. So this gives a bandwidth of what would be the optimal training, not as one uh, percentage or one absolute number, but a, an array in which the choices can be made. Next slide, please. 
So this model has been in place for over 20 years in the Netherlands, and so quite works quite well for the different uh, medical occupations and physician uh, groups we have in the Netherlands. Uh, it is uh, actually working with regard to this balancing of stakeholders, involved stakeholders. It's also based on the principle of planning long, acting short, updating often, often. So every three years, this uh, this uh, this exercise is done, and uh, uh, training inflow advice is not given. However, for the future, next slide, please. Uh, one of the particular uh, challenges we are facing is that uh, occupations are not single occupations, are not uh, working in silos. Uh, they are increasingly working together. And if you think, think of uh, task shifting and also, but also the reorganizational healthcare and uh, occupational boundaries, there is an increasing need to uh, combine and to align the uh, health workforce planning systems, or for instance, general practitioners on the one hand, and medical specialists on the other hand. But likewise with general practitioners and the primary care nurses, for instance. So these, this connection is actually our challenge for, for the future. And we are working now to, towards an integrated planning throughout different occupations and combining those models uh, in a technical, but also in an organizational way. Next slide, next slide, please. Because the organizational part is as, uh, as, as, as important. So what you need for combining planning models for different occupations are substitution ratios. So how would you translate if a certain type of task shifting would occur and continue in terms of ratio, capacity units, etc. But likewise, the planning uh, policy planning models also needs to be extended. It needs to be extended with not only the training institutes and the occupational organizations, but also for multiple training institutes, multiple occupational organizations. And getting there around to the table of what type of task delegation and substitution is desirable, feasible, and also what would be the, uh, the need for such uh, task shifting. Uh, so these are the next step actually we are currently also working on. And uh, that is also, well, uh, what is ahead from us, next slide please. And in relation to this, I was asked to pose a question to you as an audience. And this would be my question. So as you have understood our, our um, our health workforce modeling is basically um, based on the assumption that you can actually turn that button. You can control um, the amount and supply of health workforce that they create every area by adjusting training inflow. Training is obviously the engine of any health uh, workforce labor model. However, um, we increasingly see that training inflow uh, is not enough. It also requires other types of uh, measurements, other types of policy uh, instruments just uh, in, in relation to this. And this is also a next puzzle for our uh, system of health workforce modeling to not only calculate what would be the optimal training for what would be exact, uh, what exactly would be a set of uh, measurements um, to, uh, you know, to solve the biggest problems I think we are currently facing to have enough health workforce uh, available for the future challenges we have in our country. So that would be uh, my question for the audience. And I feel like uh, this is all right for the moment. Perfect, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a great presentation and um, um, what a great series of uh, speakers we've had today. Um, some real depth and um, real kind of uh, expertise um, from across uh, different parts of the globe in relation to this. And the questions have really generated a lot of uh, debate and discussion within the chat box. And I'm just really delighted um, for uh, colleagues who have been able to kind of uh, challenge us in terms of our thinking. And we've got some really rich ideas coming back in relation to that. So whilst the speakers perhaps 
gather themselves for two minutes before the the the, the Q and A session, which I'll um, I've got a few lined up for them. I think there are a couple of um, questions obviously posed which really get into some of the detail. Uh, Rob obviously set out this, um, how do we ensure responsiveness and flexibility of planning? And lots of ideas and debates coming through the chat box um, about um, uh, techniques and tools, uh, particularly around teams, etc. I've got a, a little little uh, question for you, Rob, before we get into the kind of uh, Q and A session. Which kind of uh, uh, so digital impact you mentioned it's come back in the feedback. You know, kind of how, how do you how do you conceptualise that in your planning? Yeah. So, so look, Mark. One of the reasons we've got this reasonably simple framework is is that it allows us to capture detailed examples of it so you know so some of the words in those boxes you know whether it be service transformation or workforce transformation if you then take an example like digital you know which could have a massive change couldn't it and and, and not just a massive change to practice but we need to equip people to make that change to practice you know um which we're doing through the building the digital ready workforce piece but this is the this is the problem with these models is that they're 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 quite nice at the high level, but then you have to go and apply them to stuff. <laughs> and there's and frankly, there's just so much of it. That complex landscape can can frankly be overwhelming and a bit terrifying. So look, you have to eat it in little slices. Um, I quite like you know there was Ronald doing a, a single profession doing the doing the physician modelling, you know. But coming back to the question about that was mainly about the supply, but how do you change the other things? You know, um, so there's a lot of consistency in there, but but also don't ignore those things. That's the trouble is that people think, and I think what we just saw is that if people think just new supply and training is the answer, you don't go and pursue the change of the service model using the digital tools, you know, or the use of carers and patients themselves in their self care. You know, and, and that's one of the challenges is that we often think in little silos. What, what about the robots? What about the drugs? What about the carers? And the power is in their combined impact. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, really helpful. And I'll, I'll, I'll link in a little bit later on because we've got some really good questions about that. But really, um, top three challenge question was fantastic, actually, and lots of stuff coming back around um, uh to collecting data and turning it into intelligence and actually there's a real kind of how do we get professions to think very differently you know change management is a real real problem and challenge for us uh, in all, all settings um one of my questions though is for you is, is around around data quality i hear a lot about the use of data but data quality in health systems around planning can sometimes be a real challenge have you got any kind of thoughts and views around uh, your approaches to improving data quality to help some of these kind of uh, uh, big issues so uh, in belgium we are very lucky to have the um, national cadaster as i've um, uh, explained um, and it's uh, updated almost daily, um, so we're sure that it's a high quality source. So the basis of our of our data is, uh, is high quality. But of course, uh, there are some um, variables, some interesting things you would like to uh, uh, which you like to improve our planning with, for example. Um, for um, doc medical doctors, um, they are um, most of them are self-employed. But how do we do not know where their practice is? Of course, it has been registered once at the start of their career, but when it changed, um, so um, data on on uh, this. On the, the numbers or the FPEs, it's all good quality. But then, if you have some uh, more specific information, it can be uh, quite a challenge. And uh, when I started uh, health workforce planning um, 10 years ago, um, I was young, I'm still young, but I was. <laughs> And I thought, well, it will be okay. We will have the, we will, we will have the data quality will improve, and our and our data our reports will be so much better. And I um, I understand now after ten years that it's not. Um, it takes um, it it takes a lot of time, but it's just some good luck also to have um, 
good contacts with all services that can provide uh, the data. Um, it's um, um, unfortunately it's about uh, who do you know and how will how much effort that person is willing to uh, implement in uh, improving our data as well. Um, it's really um, it's it's also a challenge as well. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And um, and thank you for, for that. Um, uh, I've got a number of questions uh, for uh, Gila, but she's just stepped out for two moments. But Rob, I can see your hand yeah, up. Can, Is that can right? I, yeah, just can I just come in? Because um, look, I've really enjoyed my international collaboration. There's we have, there's a group called the International Health Workforce Collaborative, which is Australia, New Zealand, Canada and, uh, and, and colleagues. Uh, and this question of data is is always on everyone's mind. And one of the things that struck me is just how important the fundamental design of your system is in how data is provided. Um, so, so Ronald was talking about, you know, the insurance provider and, uh, and, and user system. We, of course, have a universal healthcare system, largely tax and, and state funded. And, and these things create different conditions within which we do or don't have data. So we are, look, look colleagues in England, you, you may think it's difficult, but frankly, having a national electronic staff record system is fabulous please don't say it's not i mean that it has its moments and we have national um, regulatory bodies you know so there are countries that would kill for that level of detail like i can assume. now we've still got gaps primary care we're still weak on the relationship between work and workload and workforce which may be held at providers but not aggregated and that's the kind of landscape mark you get these holes in different systems um that, that people like ronald and Verley and myself we work around um, because we've got some good stuff and then we've got some gaps. Um, and we're always nagging to try and fill the gaps is a workforce planner's life. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and great role, uh, uh, an advocate for um, from ESR. But yeah, I, 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 I know many of our uh, UK based <laughs> colleagues <laughs> might struggle yeah. with that, but it's great to hear about how that works all, uh, across um, many different nations. Um, We've got so many questions coming in. I've got a, a nice list here where I can go into individual questions. We've had some really good feedback on, on some of the themes and I think great uh, uh, response and answer to uh, Professor Battenberg's question, you know, uh, re removing healthcare from the political sphere and facing facts. Goodness me, um, that probably is another seminar in its entirety, um, actually, but I'm sure we'll touch upon these um, in, a, in a bit later. But actually, before we kind of kick off the next session, where I've got loads of questions now coming in for uh, our fantastic uh, panellists, actually, I'm really delighted um, that we've uh, got our first question is going to be asked live by Dr. Goran Stevanovic, um, who is our special guest um, and actually one of our participants in the action learning set from our Northern Macedonian uh, group. So um, I'm really delighted to welcome Goran to the stage to uh, pose his uh, first question. Thank you, Professor Radford. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to, to thank every, everyone on the panel today. Uh, it's been incredibly inspiring to, to listen to all of your work. And I will be honest with you, I think each of these presentations can be turned into a mod module by itself. And uh, someone that has, uh, I'm, a, I'm a physician by training, but I also have a medical education background. I have a master's in medical education. Um, it, it was fascinating to see things from all of these perspectives, from workforce development in healthcare, but also workforce development in education in general. So um, in, in a couple of the presentations, more, more often than not, we hear, how do we bridge this, this planning process, this data collection process to actually establishing and implementing these things in person. So I am very curious as a qualitative researcher about the effects that both organizational and individual cultures and, and people's backgrounds have on approaching workforce development and digging into all of this complexity that Professor Rob talked about and, and taking all the complexity of planning and adding new, new parts to workforce in every country. My question to you is, do you have any advice or tips and tricks on how to increase buy-in by using cultural differences and diversity within our systems to our advantage when we're doing workforce development and planning. Thank you so much. Fantastic, thanks for a great question. Is anybody like to pick up the baton on that one? I, I was thinking you might, Mark, actually, which is 
<laughs> so, so why don't why don't I start? And I think look, and I think Gila made some great points in her presentation about this, you know, the, the cultural norms and, and the behavioural norms that shifted because of the pandemic. Oh, here she is, so great, you know, um, that enabled that challenge to the scope of, of practice. And interestingly. Look, Ronald, Ronald gets to use the word substitution, which we never use in England. We, we say multidisciplinary team and role and skills. Okay. <laughs> um, and we say that because of those cultural norms, Goran, okay. you know, which is how, how do you talk about professionalism and team in a respectful way that allows the right thing to be done for, for, the, um, for, the, for the clients? And, and Ronald comes back to that thing about systems. I think you had protect revenues and, you know, our conditions are different to that. I mean, there's still something about professional status, but but because of we're paid through salary, it's not so much the kind of I'm trying to protect my revenue. And so you need to be really conscious of the dynamics in your patch. I know in America they have real trouble with, you know, on the opiates crisis they were going to use ANPs, but it was in the med you know Medicaid stopped them and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think you need to find that collaborative space where clinicians lead these changes themselves. Um, is, but Mark, you're a clinician, so you might have some insight. Yeah, no, thank you. I, 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 I'm conscious I'm chair because I could leap okay. in here, but actually people want to hear from from our fantastic panellists. And I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to come to, to Gila in a moment on, on that one. But you're absolutely right, Rob. And I think the pandemic has taught us lots around how we've approached the design of clinical teams and services. And I think there is an inherent need for professions, actually, the broader church of professions, to hold a mirror up to some of our traditions, actually, in relation to the way we deliver service models and actually think about what it is to be around, uh, the, um, around the, the client and the service user. But um, Gila, I mean, uh, you, you've obviously done a great deal thinking around this, um, particularly in terms of how you move that from kind of clinical practice to policy. Um, have you got any thoughts around the kind of uh, challenge posed by Goran in relation to how do we how do we challenge some of our professions to think differently because I mean, I'm a nurse and we can sometimes be um, quite quite fixed in the way we approach things rightly in some cases but uh, others may be resistant to change I, I, perhaps your experience as clinicians also so it's an excellent question and I think that that's part of what I love about my work in the Israel Midwives Association I missed I missed the beginning of the conversation I apologize if I'm, I'm saying things that were already said but the first work that we had to do when we're now trying to establish midwifery continuity of care in our country, which is a colossal national change for the midwives to have to understand their own first definition of their scope of practice that they're not aware of, is changing midwifery mentality of how they should be working versus how they are working. And that, I think, comes into play with strong associations. We are working on strengthening our midwife association so we can first reach the midwives and then reach the policy. When we first started discussing midwifery continuity of care, the response we got from the midwives was, what are you talking about? We already have enough to do. We have enough on our plate. Why should we suture? Why should we do those things? And the first work we had to do was strengthen the midwife association, get the midwives to become collaborative, um, cooperative parts to our changing to our plan on a national level. And then we moved forward with the policy. And this is work that we're still doing. We had a, um, I'm trying to translate the word in Hebrew, a kennis. We had a, uh, a big event where all the midwives came together and we uh, explained our case and explained what we wanted to do. We heard their feedback, town hall-like events. I think it all starts on the ground level working up. It's once you get your people on the ground understanding what you want to change, then you move on to the policy. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, I, I've absolutely. I mean, it's really, really helpful. I mean, to think about, A, the nature of collaboration, but also the challenge that we can bring to each other's professionals along alongside alongside uh, others who are involved in the design of services, be they policymakers, planners, um, administrators and others. So I think it's a, a really, really important um, challenge to us. Um, one, of my, one of my kind of uh, kind of the subsets to that, of course, is that a, a lot of what is designed around what professions do is often intrinsically linked back to wider societal perspectives of what professions should or shouldn't be doing. And I suppose one of the questions I'd like to kind of uh, keep going in, in the chat box is that um, how, do, how do we continually evolve our thinking in relation to what professions can do, recognising that globally that there are really there are real differences in expectation and level of practice 
Um, um, in, in some countries, of course, you know, uh, the medics are, are in the lead for lots of services, whereas in other countries, um, I think that it's, it's seen as more multi-professional. So I think, you know, I'd, I'd be great to kind of think about that for the, the panel a little bit later. But I've kind of got some great questions coming in. And, and, and Dr. Uh, Vikram, I've got a great question here because you, you, you talked about mobility and the global nature of workforce. And um, you kind of mentioned, and there's a great question that's come in around um, enhancing mobility is really, really important in the global workforce agenda. And, and one of the questions came up was around global passporting actually and and kind of a really interesting concept so kind of uh, have you any thoughts about that what's your kind of perspective because obviously in a, a you know leadership role like you have that that's kind of a really important question um both for people uh training in different countries moving to to others but also the the nature of people working and, and moving to support other nations uh post pandemic what, what are your thoughts on a global passport Oh, I think he's still on mute. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, um, it's a very, a very interesting thought, Professor Mark. But, uh, you know, I would say, you know, based on my experience, I think talking about global passport now, when we are still debating upon what should be the standard uh, training, what should be the qualification, what kind of set. See, it's actually very strange, like, you know, unlike any other profession in the world, it is the health profession where, you know, subject is same, you know, it's the human being which you are treated if we are talking in terms of uh, doctors or uh, allied health staff, uh, subject is the same, but this difference in opinion on the qualification, on training, on certification, on the kind of right certificates, degrees you should hold, is so different from country to country that if you are a doctor and due to some reason you have to move to a, another part of the world, it's most likely that you will, or a nurse, it's most likely you will remain unemployed for some time till you are actually able to match up your qualification to that country. So I think these are such very basic things which have to be addressed first. COVID, I felt, you know, as I was saying, it has simply thrown something which those who are already there, I, I'm sure the professors and the panel here must have been dealing, it, dealing with them in their own discussion, but it's something which has thrown it out in open. Now you know that, you know, a, a health, health crisis in, in some part of the world where, where which you think is very far away is not that far away, you know? And uh, so our, when we say global passport, I think first people should agree that there is a global health and we all are very intrinsically connected to each other. So first agree to that and then agree to the ways in which we could have some basic standards in all cutting across health professionals, which if somebody has those, I don't know, those credit points or those basic standards, you can ask them like, you know, for a, for a pilot, you ask how many hours have you flown a plane? So maybe something like that, you know, something which is doesn't gives that much of uh, merit to your language or the country or the institution you've gone to, but to your skill. And once you get into that, then we can talk about, you know, uh, having a you know, global passport health professionals. I hope they have it one day. For what I know is that even peer-to-peer -peer consultations are difficult if you are doing it across countries, you know, doctors or any health professional is very afraid in giving an opinion because they don't know, because at the end of the day, there is a human life. So until unless they have that legal protection, until and unless they have that assurance, it is something which will remain difficult, but uh, that is where the effort should be. And that is where the effort is there of the governments also, and of the, I would say universities and hospitals, and even the uh, body of professionals across countries that, you know, it's a point of focus. And um, well, I hope it happens sooner than later. Thanks, Dr. Vick. I mean, great. I mean, it's absolutely the, the issue around around uh, recognizing um, uh, a different approaches, a rethink in relation to what people do and how they train, but also, of course, the, the global nature of health is is really important. Um, and I think it's a, a really useful descriptor around kind of rethinking that. And I think there's a, a role for all of us to play in that. So thank you. Great, great uh, answer to that. Um, 
Professor Basmer, if I could come to you a moment, um, what uh, you used the example of of um, doctors in your analysis, which is really helpful. And there's a question that's come in around how does um, in in Holland. Um, and, and other perhaps countries you've worked with recognize that in some cases, actually, it, it may not be um, a doctor in future delivering that part of the health service. And when you're doing planning numbers, what what's the thinking that goes into different approaches, different professions who might um, fulfill requirements around a, a patient? Have you got any kind of examples from your own work that illustrate how thinking has changed in different um, different countries? Well, thanks for the question and uh, for posing and uh, transferring the question to me, actually. Uh, I, think, I think it's a key question and I hope to have uh, also addressed this question in my presentation. Uh, for a long time, looking back 10, 15 years ago, let, let's say the occupational structure was quite solid, fixed in terms of occupational, occupation, educational careers. More, more or less stable. And this is indeed changing, so that's simply the practice. And also the thinking uh, of, of the occupational boundaries uh, is also changing. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, also, it's also a complex, uh, uh, it's a complex question and discussion, of course. Um, I'm a soci sociologist by training, so I know about uh, the, uh, the political tensions and the uh, this was, if you look at the basic uh, studies on, on the professionalism and professional boundaries, uh, then it's all still recognizable. But what we see is that the joint responsibility and the joint challenge now uh, with regard to the tensions on the labor market. So there, there needs to be a way, there needs to be new solutions and we need to reconsider. Uh, we simply need to. Otherwise, we cannot uh, live up, we cannot continue by trying to include, uh, increase training, uh, increase capacity all the way. You also need to, uh, if you have scarcity, you need to, you need innovation. And innovation needs rethinking of uh, what can, who, who does what in, in our healthcare system. And that, that seems a simple question. I know it's not, but one example is, for instance, the, if you look at oral hygiene, and dentists, just as an example, are ophthalmologists and optometrists. Also, probably, these are classic cases or more classic uh, um, examples in which we in which we see. Uh, we use the use the word substitution, but let's let's call it our shifting or sharing. Okay, um, and there we see indeed that those occupational organizations are also coming together in the joint responsibility because. It's of everybody's interest then that we can meet the healthcare needs and the healthcare demands. And, um, and if, if you bring those occupations around the table with this joint challenge, then uh, not immediately <laughs> they come together and have a consensus, of course, but the urge, uh, the urgency to come to a consensus uh, and uh, knowing that this is a slow process, and this is not done overnight. But, you know, we all know that it takes time, but, but actually it starts at the, at the shop floor. Uh, in, in many cases, already on the shop floor of any uh, primary care center or hospital, uh, task shifting and rethinking of what can be done more efficiently is already happening. And the thing is that this needs to be, um, you know, this needs to be extended um, on, on the regional level and the national level. And um, I think health workers planning as such um, can help, can help to show what would be the consequences if uh, not overnight, but let's say in a number of years, the costs are shifted. What would, as a scenario, just think about it and what would be the consequences of this in terms of training or what is uh, required capacity that can open eyes and that can open positions. Uh, I'm convinced uh, with that, and uh, but still, um, um, it remains a complex set of things. So, what would be my, my, my suggestion? 
Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really complex one. And, and, and of course, um, recognising some of the, the, the tensions around maximising the expertise of other professionals in different environments and the tension that creates around jurisdiction and um, professional role and, and that they're, they're not unique to, to um, an individual health system. They're something we, we see uh, across the globe. I've got I've got a great question, Verley, for you, actually, is around um, uh, there was a, in your presentation around the demand for nursing care actually it's quite a specific question actually about how how, do, how is that determined um um is there a kind of a, an approach you take in, um in relation to understanding the kind of demand for for nursing requirements in your in your system but uh, that's come up a couple of times in the questions so the demand for nurses um uh Luckily, we have um, I, um, today the Federal Public Service of Health in Belgium um, works together with the National Institute of Health and Disability. So, in that National Institute of Health and Disability, it, it's all about health expenditure by uh, patients uh, for every health profession. Um, so, um, the national health insurance, they know exactly uh, the amount and also the number of um, acts or health care, um, uh, acts or health provided by nurses, but also for medical doctors, all professions. So we use that data to um, calculate or to use it as the demand for nurses. It means it. It, it's great because it's um, fairly well detailed and good quality, but uh, those prof healthcare professions who don't have a link with the National Institute of Health, for example, um, nursing assistants or other uh, paramedical professions, it's difficult to um, calculate the demand. And there are also professions, of course, with a lot of with a high uh, high amount of unmet needs or needs that are not covered with the health insurance. So um, those are also uh, factors we try to um, include in our models, but it's not represented in the graphs I've shown today because um, uh, the work that we just finished is about the baseline projections. So it's just. Um, the the history yeah the history until 2018 and 2020 so what happened um, between uh, what happened until now and what will happen if it continues and so we take into account the unmet needs and all the other factors in our next um, in our next report that will be published later this year. Fantastic. Thank you. you know, great, great. I mean, great to hear about the kind of methods and ideas and the assumptions that are built into around the, the modelling there, which is uh, really helpful. And you know, a, a report due soon, which I'm sure colleagues will be really interested to, to see your work uh, on that. So thank you. Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions, Gita, for you, actually, around um, uh, lots of people say kind of inspiring and, and how you kind of um, talked very much around real impact of, of planning um, and, and how that links to patient care. And, and at the end of your presentation, you called for uh, um, greater leadership amongst nurses and midwives. And because, you know, there are barriers that exist um, in, in many countries. And I know Howard's on from the International uh, Council of, of Nurses on, on the chat today. But um, I suppose we've got, I've got a double question for you. The first one is, how do we overcome those barriers, do you think? And, and, and do you think COVID has galvanised professions to be more engaged with this? Or do you think that it's reduced their appetite for activism? But uh, yeah, I wonder if you might, might uh, give us some insights into those two areas. Those are amazing questions. Those are questions I ask myself every day. To answer the last question first, and to go back to the question that was asked of Vikram, I believe that we have made tremendous strides in COVID. We were forced, the world was forced to make strides in COVID. A global passport, we, they were busing in nurses from California to New York, where in reality, that isn't something that you can do in the United States. Your licensure is statewide, but all of a sudden nurses can practice this countrywide. 
we sh we shouldn't go take back these progress that we have made as countries, as societies, as people. We need to create a national scope of practice. A midwife, the definition of a midwife in England needs to be the definition of a midwife in Israel and in America. These are steps 100% COVID-19 has galvanized the global medical society to make huge change that we need to keep that momentum going. We cannot go back to business as usual. We cannot say for the pandemic that was okay, but now it isn't. That would be a huge mistake. And how do we create that change on the ground? We go to the individuals, we go to the people, we invest in every person. And that sounds like a lot, but that's what we're doing here today. People took time out of their day to listen to what's happening across all of our countries. How was that change implemented? We need to have sister countries. It's something that I say a lot. Um, sorry, I keep using the UK for an example, but Holland is an excellent example, or Australia, or New Zealand. In countries where midwifery is established, midwifery continuity of care is a given in Denmark. We need to have sister countries that are going to turn to those countries who are a little bit less developed or have issues and help them develop in actual practical skills. I would love to have a chief midwifery, midwifery officer. I don't know how to do that. How did England get a chief midwifery officer? How did Australia get a chief midwifery Teach me. We need to have sister countries. We need to have people who are willing to come down, hands on the ground, create actual plans per year of things we want to implement on a global scale and begin to make practical individual plans per country to get these things going. And it will happen with global um, passports and global healthcare, looking at all the change we've made throughout COVID on an international level. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. great. Um, and actually, there's a there's a really um, great um, kind of as point um, in the chat box, actually, linking back around kind of the global nature of kind of the, the, the political dynamics we operate in. And of course, the post COVID environment is hugely challenging. And and actually, one question for, for Dr. Vikram, actually, is, is around the point you made around national boundaries, actually, um, and the country from where one holds a degree or the licensing arrangement versus membership in another. And, and a really good question, actually, around refugee status. You know, we've, we've got in many, many countries um, uh, represented by the panelists on here around approaches post pandemic in supporting refugee status and therefore supporting those individuals coming coming through. Um, but one of the questions I want to bring to you, Dr. Berko, because you, you touched upon both digital, but you also touched upon, um, you know, the pressures and burnout. Um, and the implications of that of the healthcare workforce, and um, I'm I'm really interested in, in as a as a state leader, you know, involved in in your system. I mean, what what approaches do you think we need to take coming out of the back of the pandemic to recognise both the kind of moral injury and the um, and and the mental health pressures associated with the staff? Do you, do you think that's a, a, an inherent lever we need to pull in workforce planning? See, um, I would like to say. You know, as I think Jilo was mentioning, the lot of a stride has been made during COVID and it has been made cutting across the sectors. I don't think that even before COVID, the issue of mental stress, the issue of overwork of health professionals, especially those dealing with public health, you know, was not there. It was there. It was brought to the fore. And of course, we all were at the brink. So people were doing shifts, which were more than what they normally used to do. But the fact is that all these uh, issues were there. Of course, new issues also came and we, we made a lot of strides. So like, you know, I mean, um, I remember when I was, uh, you know, I was in a medical college and among our ethics chapter, it was taught that you should never do a consultation on phone. It is unethical because you should see the patient. How can you even advise someone without looking at them physically? So. And that was like 20, 25 years ago. So you see, it is it is something. And from there till here, when, when we, you know, without telemedicine, I think such a large section today will be deprived of uh, a proper consultation, whether it's from their nurse or whether it is from their doctor. I mean, it is, it, it is a, one of the essential tools of access to healthcare. So similarly, all these things have come up. And I don't think the the right step will be to not to think that it was a response which was to an emergency situation. 
it is basically these are the issues which we need to tackle whether it is of the uh, professional training whether it is of recognizing qualification whether it is of the mental stress to health professionals whether it is how to how to use this uh, this um, um, this mine of digital health data which has been created how to share it for research how to safeguard it because the people who this data you are collecting never gave it for research or for collaboration or sharing to a third country so so these are the questions which have emerged and these are the questions with this i think is the first time that everybody across the board is also looking at solutions because questions were there but now you have so many models which are which have come up and going forward i think um, you know it is it depends on professionals like you and institutions and the uh, obviously at the back of everything the government and the uh, different uh, think tanks to take it forward and of course all these issues will remain important thank you brilliant thank you so much i mean uh, we we're, we're rapidly running out of time i mean, I, I could keep you all day the questions keep coming thick and fast but i know you all have uh, day day jobs or, or another work to do but uh, i've got one final question for rob if i may before i kind of uh, wrap up if that's okay rob we've got a question around you know not all systems have have necessarily national goals and leadership around workforce planning and have you got any kind of concrete examples where people might be able to kind of influence you know the, the political leadership to prioritize different approaches around service and workforce planning yeah look it's um you've got to work in the system you're in so you say so you've got to observe what, what what you are first and and that's one of the joys of doing international stuff is you know we have this massive universal healthcare system and therefore frankly things are easier i can't believe i just said that but 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 you know, I have colleagues who work in federal systems and out-of-pocket driven systems, insurance driven systems, and you have to observe those things. And then you need to think, if I take that kind of general framing that I, I kind of start with, how, how do I get my task done? You know, so so it is going back to the lens you want to plan through, whether that's a single pathway or for your profession. But then just ask yourself those questions. Like who who holds the levers? Who holds the employment levers? You know. Who holds the professional regulation lever? Who who holds the the design of the service system? Because usually, Mark, it's um, about relationships with those other people. It can be governance, but frankly, it's usually relationships, and frankly, it's usually talking and, and communication, and then sharing some of these ideas. And look, I've got a, got a workforce problem, but I need you to think about the team design or the service design. And they go, oh, that's not a workforce challenge. You know, well, it is. <laughs> you know, the, the, what's really interesting about the pandemic is the number of service and policy leads that have come to be aware of the workforce challenge. So most of my conversations now are with people that you wouldn't normally say are the workforce community, but are absolutely clear that they need to act to, to help us solve the challenge. Fantastic. Uh, what a great way to finish um, the seminar today. Um, I'd just like to say a huge, huge thank you to all of our presenters. And uh, they've done a phenomenal job in terms of getting across some fantastic information around their approaches to different aspects of, of workforce planning. Their insights and uh, expertise has been phenomenal. Um, and thank you so much for your kind of wisdom um, and support of the questions and answers. It's been fantastic to hear about the global nature. And, and what I'm struck by, of course, is the commonality, actually, <laughs> um, of all of the challenges, be they practical, political, um, that we all face. But actually, you know, it's been such a rich conversation and, and answered lots of questions I'm sure for colleagues around the globe who have joined us well well over a, a hundred people have been uh, joined us for the discussion and debate today to hear your presentations and and if I may um, uh, please can we send you know virtual um, and uh, congratulations to all of our presenters um, for sharing with us their their time and thoughts today their presentations and um, I really do want to to thank you on behalf of uh, Health Education England and the World Health Organization and many other partners in support of these webinar events today. Um, uh, we are really, really grateful for your time.
thank you to colleagues who have joined us um, virtually today. Thank you so much for all of your thoughts, reflections that are coming to the chat box. Um, we, we're kind of gathering those up, up as well, and we're, we're populating um, document uh, here as well to just make sure we capture those themes and ideas. Um, and of course, uh, we'll, we'll be um, recording this event or have recorded this event, so we'll be able to publish that in a, in a few days uh, time. Um, we really do value your feedback. So if there are things that you wish us to, to kind of be debating and discussing for future events, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, we will be sending out a post-event survey to help us guide these uh, discussions events, which are for us really valuable. Um, we do have a link on uh, line, which we sent out with the slides a bit later for updates on the next group of seminars. These kind of thought leadership events are absolutely fantastic. Um, and we really hope you get uh, a great deal out of them. Um, and my final thanks go to um, the phenomenal team that sits behind this virtual platform. Um, these events are hugely complex to put together, um, but we've got a great team at Health Education England who've been doing the digital line up the speakers bringing in all of the various platforms together to make this happen and uh, uh, they may be behind the screen but they do a phenomenal job in bringing all of this together for us and making everything work uh, superbly well and to make sure that our phenomenal experts and speakers uh, can and can can do their their work for us so thank you very much uh, for the team uh, who have pulled this together um, and colleagues that draws our seminar to a conclusion today. So um, I, I, I wish you well. Um, I thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you once again for our speakers, experts and colleagues around the globe that have joined us uh, for this event. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at a future seminar.